Our scripture reading this morning is going to be from Romans chapter 10. And if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to use your pew Bible. It's on page 946. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer for God, prayer to God for them, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, and the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call, to, call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I think the Lord's timing is is perfect timing. As I think about how often he orchestrates and puts together what he does. Pastor Jason made the announcement concerning the fact that we're having men's fraternity that's on Thursday mornings. Last week we talked about socialism. This week we're going to be talking about globalism and what does the Bible have to say about these things. And a while back, Ken and I were talking, and he had said, hey, maybe we should start up um, men's fraternity again. I sensed an interest in the men in getting back together for that. And, and uh, I wasn't pushing back on it. I was just um, waiting a little bit. And, and, uh, but ultimately, we started this past Thursday. And what was going to happen was um, Ken wanted to show a video, and I had some setup so that I could use some my phone and put it, plug it in to the TV and be able to show it uh, a scene from um, the Twilight Zone, which you're going, that's in the, the, the study of men's fraternity, Twilight Zone? But the scene was very uh, effective and it was very um, crucial to what we were going to be talking about. So I was going to get there early to set that up, and Pastor Jason has a cable in the youth building, and I, so I stole it from there and I brought it over here. and. Uh, was walking into the church and I came into the um, entryway there and uh, lo and behold right in front of me was the rug that you put on the carpet so that when people walk in and their shoes are wet they have boots or whatever they can wipe their feet on that and it would give the carpet a longer life but that that rug was turned upside down 
and it was bunched up against the doors that would be going right into the church foyer. And as I um, looked at that, I was like, man, that's weird. The wind is blowing that strong? I mean, that is like amazing that that's the case. And so I just got my key out, and I was starting to open the door and move the carpet, and I heard, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And so I saw two arms come up like this. And I thought Roy was trying to pull something on me. I, honestly, I, <laughs> Roy pulls so many tricks that I was thinking Roy's under there. He, it, funny Roy. It wasn't Roy. This guy goes on and he's confessing to me as he's going. I guess he's in church, so maybe he felt like he needed to do that. But I was, I was cold. I, I got released from the Warren County Jail. And it was midnight and I was walking to Washington. And I saw your church. And I saw that open. I thought, I'm freezing out here. It was rainy and I just want to come in. And, uh, and so that's how he kept himself warm from probably 1 o'clock till I woke him up. I said, well, come on in in a little bit. There's going to be some guys and there's going to be coffee. We're going to have some coffee together and some coffee cake. And, and so I let him, I just opened the door and he just stood there and he was still a little wet. And, and I was just getting my stuff and taking care of things. And he said, Is there, can, I, can I sit down over here? And it was the pew there. And I said, sure, yeah, go ahead. And, and I said, what's your name? Man? My name's Tony. And he told me a little more about himself. And then um, he said, hey, come on downstairs. I'll, I'm going to set some stuff up, and you can have some food with us. And, and by the way, if any of you are thinking, this is an April Fool's thing. It isn't, all right? This happened. And so I got him a blanket from the nursery, and he just had that blanket on him. And what was so cool, I didn't tell any of the guys anything about him. I just said, this is my new friend, Tony. And our guys are a joy to be with. Scott, when you came in and you just made him feel like a million bucks, hey, young man, you do that. Hey, young man, you do that to me and I'm older than you. It's really nice of you. <laughs> but you made him feel so special. I was definitely going to say anything to Roy. Roy is a f former cop. and uh, <laughs> But no, Roy, just your, your love and your um, servant's heart and I could go on of the different men that came in there, and they met my new friend, Tony. And we actually, we were in the conference room across from the kitchen. We had to move down the hall because more guys showed up, and, and Tony's sitting there. And he even answered a question. And he's drinking his coffee. And we're just spending that time together. And then I said to him, I said, hey, Tony, um, I'll drive you down to Washington after this. He said, oh, that'd be great. And so I uh, got in the car, and I go, boy, heavy discussion for a Thursday morning, socialism and the Christian, you know. He says it was so good. It, these, these, these guys, they're just so kind and so friendly. And I said, do you know why, Tony? It's because Jesus Christ has changed their lives. Jesus Christ is what makes the difference. Any opportunity I can bring up the Lord, I want to bring him up. And, and so as we're driving down, I said, are you, are you hungry? He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, let's get some breakfast at, at McDonald's <laughs> in Washington. Yeah, I know you're shocked by that one. Um, but on the way down, I just said, hey, are you interested in any of this church stuff and this Christian stuff? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that lately said, well, let me ask you a question. If there was this guy at the gate of heaven, and, and this guy asked you, he said, why should I let you in? What, what would be the reason? And he says, hmm, that's a good question. Well, I, I've, I've tried to be a good guy. I, I, and he started to go through his resume, and I wanted to turn to him and go, you do know you just got out of jail. <laughs> but I didn't. And then he got done going through his resume, which is what I get most of the time when I ask that question. And I said, would you like to know what the Bible says on how you can know that you know that you can go to heaven? He says, yeah. And I started to talk to him about the fact that we're all sinners and we can't save ourselves. 
There's not one thing that we can do. And we've, we fall short of the glory of God. And then that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then I come to the verse that Matt read to you today. It's right there, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So have you heard that? He says, I've never heard that before. He says, that was so good. I said, well, I'm, I want to encourage you to take that gift. You can do that here with me or you can do that on your own. But I want you to know that's a gift that's given to you. He said, thank you. So we had breakfast. I heard more about his life. And uh, he was a nice young man. A nice young man, just like all of us that needs a Savior. And so he was given that. And then I dropped him off at the Washington Library because he was going to meet his sister. But I don't think it was an accident that a while back, Ken said, hey, we should get this thing started because why would it be that Thursday? That Thursday I would probably be at another McDonald's, all right? <laughs> and I wouldn't have met him. But God knew. And I want to encourage you to take opportunities with people. And the biggest thing I think that was a turning point was that he felt loved here. Because our guys were just, just such an encouragement. God is using you as you desire to be used by him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of your word and the truth of the gospel. And I'm asking you, Lord, now that you would use our time together here in Romans 10 to challenge us, to push us, to encourage us. You know exactly what we need so that we move on for the glory of Christ. We can rest in him. We can trust in him. This is your work. You've just allowed us to be a part of it. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been looking at these, these three chapters here where we've delved into last week. We looked at Romans chapter 9. I hope you have your Bible open to Romans 10. And I want you actually to look up into Romans 9, that last verse of Romans 9, verse 33 we were kind of ending there, obviously, as we're working through the scriptures um, last week. It says there in verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so that was a chapter, if you remember, that was looking at Israel's past, and we were looking at God's sovereignty now we come to Romans 10, which is talking about Israel's present. We're going to get the benefits of I know sometimes you're like, you're talking about Israel so much, but the Jews were the ones that blessed us with all of these items, the, the, the authoring the scriptures that God would pick of all people, this group of people called the Jews. And so as we look at that, we realize, oh, Father, we are so blessed because of this people and so in the past, they were given these things. And in his sovereignty, God has done what he's done in doing the work of choosing them and doing the work of choosing however God sees fit to do what he does. So why are they, what are they tripping over in this, this cornerstone that is there? Why, this stone of stumbling. The, the word there is a scandalon. You hear the word scandal? That's a, a stumbling of somebody. That's where we get this word. And, and so what are the things that would make this group of people stumble? Well, stay with me for a second here. First of all, it's their pride. Their pride. Um, that their goodness would not do the job. See, the law, that, that the Ten Commandments and all those things, those rules that were given at the beginning uh, of the the people of Israel after they had come out of Egypt. Um, they, they thought, even though they've read the scriptures over and over, they lost sight of the fact that it was not their goodness. They, they looked at the law as an end. And all the law was supposed to do is that you look at the law and you go, I can't do this. 
which would ultimately lead you to a person named Jesus that would, that would be sacrificed. And by faith, you'd receive that. And so their pride, they're like, how, and that's why Jesus was constantly pushing back on the religious establishment of that day. You cannot live this Christian life in and of yourself. You cannot do it. I'm talking to you, too. You can't. And if, if you've tried, how much longer does it take you to sin? Honestly. You ever do that resolution thing? I'm not going to do that anymore. And within an hour, you're doing it. What's up with that? It's because you can't. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so Christ offended them. That's the scandal. He offended them. Even as they saw all throughout the Old Testament, the prophecies, those things should have made them go, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, we can't do this. We've been a, we've been a hard-hearted and a, and a stiff-necked people. You think they would have got it, but they, they missed it. So it's their pride caused them to stumble, but also their prejudice caused them to stumble. That God would include Gentiles. A Gentile is anyone that's not a Jew uh, in, in that salvation story. Um, they're, they're, we were here at the beginning. And now these new people are coming along and you're, you're asking us to believe that God would include them. We don't want this in the... Hebrew there, the goyim, these Gentile dogs to be a part of the story. And God says, oh, I've always been doing this. Remember what Je almost got Jesus thrown off a cliff? He started talking about um, a widow that's being ministered to by a prophet, and of all things, he picks a, a Gentile, and Jesus would go through those things. And up to that point, he's the golden boy. But when he starts including the Gentiles, that's when they want to throw him off a cliff, which, by the way, is a, is a sign that you're not very popular as a speaker. I want you to know that. Okay. <laughs> and so pride and prejudice is the thing that's causing them to, to stumble. Oh, oh, by the way, it could happen with us, too. If you've grown up in church, if you've done church a very long time, and uh, you are starting to rest on your laurels, and you're trying to rest in your good works. Good works follow salvation. We're as workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works. But that happens after salvation by grace through faith. Or our prejudice. I've been in this church for, and you could list off, I, my parents were charter members. There's a long word that shuts that down. So, doesn't matter. What's Christ done lately in your life? And so, we come to this passage of Scripture here in Romans 10, that's dealing with Israel's present, but it's also dealing with God's equity. You want to talk about fairness? This is a, this is a whole chapter about God's fairness. So point one, number one, if you want to take notes, is in the back of your bulletin there. The prayer concerning God's righteousness. The prayer concerning God's righteousness. Look at verse 1 again with me. Brothers, I love how familial this is. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, that being Israel, because he just got done talking about them, is that they may be saved. Truly, God gives equal opportunities. He still gives Gentiles an invitation to salvation while giving the Jews the same opportunity. He hasn't stopped working with his covenant people. He's He's amazing. He, he keeps doing it. And I want you to notice, too, here, the power of prayer when it comes to evangelism. 
If, if prayer had nothing to do with evangelism, this would not be there. But there's, there is, a, there is a, um, a work here that um, comes together with God. You can say, does prayer matter? Prayer matters. I mean, we see it throughout Scripture. How does it make sense with God understanding things and orchestrating things? How does that make sense? I don't know. Remember, I'm going to say that a lot up here. I don't get some of this. All glory to God that he includes me in this process by moving me to pray and to not, and to, to, to not stop praying. That's the heart of God. Let me ask you, maybe even today, today could be a day where you are, you've, you've been praying for somebody, but almost it's not like you resolved this morning to not pray anymore, but you're tired. You've prayed for this individual or these individuals for a very long time, and you feel like giving up. I want to encourage you, keep praying. And when he answers it, oh, the blessing that you get, just smiling that, Father, you moved in my heart to pray for this individual. And I would encourage you, there's a couple people that maybe, boy, I want to reach them for Christ. Would you write their names down on your notes there? That I've thought about this, but I haven't been fervent in prayer. Write their names down and pray for them. And watch what he does. Watch what he does. Let's keep going. Verse 2. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You ever meet somebody that is, is zealous about something? They're, they're sincere, but it's not tied to truth? What do you do with all these people throughout the world that are sincerely investing in something that is not eternal? Well, who are you to say that? Well, I'm just going with the word, okay? And you'll hear people say, you're going to study Proverbs this morning after the morning service up here there's a proverb that i've heard people say and i don't believe it's true it says this it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere Have you ever heard that one do you realize how dumb that is what if what if you're wrong i mean it's it's bad it's one thing to be wrong but to be sincerely wrong that's deception and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a lake's edge, and it's frozen, but not very frozen. It's thin ice. Is me believing that I can walk out on that into the center, is that going to carry me on thin ice? No, I'm sincere about it, but... The thing that I should be putting my faith in, the thing that is the, the thing that would hold, is not strong enough to hold. But what if I tippy toe, let's say this rock solid ice, but I tippy toe out there? That's better. That's better than being sincere running onto thin ice. And so some of, some of us. We've got a, a God that is rock solid. The ice is hard. I can rest in it. And sometimes you're a little hesitant. I'm a little hesitant. And we tippy toe out on it. The beauty of it is what we're putting our faith in is solid. And so you may be here today and you go, all I got is tippy toes on this thing. God bless you for stepping out. God help my unbelief. And so I don't know what that is for you. That could be a conversation. That could be heading a direction that you, boy, I really believe this is what God wants me to do. You've sought the word. You've sought godly counsel. You, you've uh, prayed about it. Head out trusting the Lord on solid ground. This, this zeal that is demonstrated by this legalistic conformity to law and this fierce opposition to Judaism's opponents, it, he says to them, they've got a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. 
Verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Ignorant both of God's inherent righteousness, and that's revealed in the law in the rest of the Old Testament. That's why we keep doing the Old Testament. Obviously, we're building a foundation each time we do the Old Testament. But part of the Old Testament is the holiness of God. You'll read stories and you're like, wow, God, man, this is serious stuff. That's what the Old Testament is is trying to get across. God is holy. A guy named Isaiah writes a book, sixth chapter. We hear about holy, holy, holy. Comes face to face with God. And what does he say? Oh, basically, God, don't kill me. I am undone, which means I don't have a clue about how holy you are. We see a picture of it in the New Testament. I remember that story. I even told it to the Cubbies. I was teaching the Cubbies this Wednesday. And some of the times I'm teaching the Cubbies, I'm going, are they getting this stuff? I mean, it's like major league theology, but I'm going to keep going. Remember that story where Peter is, he'd been fishing all night. And then in the morning, Jesus shows up. He's teaching some people. And then they're about to fold up camp and just stop. And Jesus goes, hey, go out, throw, throw the nets on the other side. And it's like, I'm the fisherman, you're the prophet, you're the rabbi. But I'll do it, Lord. And so he throws the net out on the other side. And just tons of fish, so much so that it starts ripping the net. And he goes, he looks at Jesus, and there's, everybody's like fired up. And Peter looks at him and he goes, it, it occurs to him who, is he, who he's dealing with. And he goes, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And once you and I get a grip of the holiness of God in our lives, instead of acting like he's a good old boy, or he's just something that I can be flippant about, God is holy. And Israel lost sight of that. And so that's why he's saying, for being ignorant, of the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. And so they sought their own, because if he, I mean, if I could attain it through my good works, that's my pride. I'm going to seek it my own. It's based on their conformity to God's law and often to the less demanding standards of their own traditions. They looked at him and they said, I, I think I can keep this. And you've got you to gotta fulfill every bit of the law. To keep it. Point number two, the source of God's righteousness. The source of God's righteousness. Look at, he said, and I, and I love this because instead of just leaving them there and not explaining what is the end of this, here it is, verse four. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He's the end. The law isn't the end. You don't stop at the law and go, I can meet this. You go to the law and go, I can't meet this. Where do I go? Oh, leads me to Jesus. Oh, you can meet it. Concerning the law, Jesus said this, Matthew 5, 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass in the law until all is accomplished. And so Jesus fulfills the law. And so the law ended when Jesus came. And why? Because it was fulfilled in him. Verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. If you want to keep the law, you must live in the law. And legalism is a horrible place. You ever meet somebody, you ever meet somebody that acts like they've never made a mistake? Don't look around. (laughs) I've met people that literally, like, say that stuff. And I'm waiting for, really? Where... If I spent enough time with you, I know I'd find something. Isn't it better to own up right away? I can't. I'm going to make mistakes. That's, that's the reality of it. So the source of God's righteousness is Christ. Verse, I mean, point three, the availability of God's righteousness. Look at verses six and seven. But the righteousness based on faith says... 
do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. Paul speaks of a righteousness based on faith as if it were a person and puts it in its mouth, a quotation from Deuteronomy 30, 12 and 13. But the word is, did I give you 14? I'm sorry, it's 12 and 13. Thirty, twelve, and 13. I write like a doctor. <laughs> and my pharmacist back there is constantly dealing with stuff. Here. His point is, and as she gets it up there in a second here, okay. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. And Moses is beating the drum that, because that, they would hear that and go, well, who can do these things? And Paul comes along and says, it was Jesus that met that. It was Jesus that did that. Because he picked these, these things way out there. How could this be done? And we find it in Christ. Look at verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. He quotes from Deuteronomy 30, 14. Here that is. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. God has clearly revealed the way of salvation. It's by faith in your mouth. It's in your heart. The message of the of faith is the way to God. So always we find these nuggets that the Jews are just passing over. And Paul is bringing them out. Point number four, the reception of God's righteousness. Look at verse nine. Because, and this is that verse, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So you see the context here? And it's not some simple statement because even demons believe. Look at this in James 2.19. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder and tremble. See, Satan believes in God. But it hasn't changed his life. This belief is a, is a complete belief. It's, it's putting your faith and trust in him. There's so much in that statement, this, this deep personal conviction without reservation that Jesus is master. He's sovereign of all. When you, when you acknowledge, I need this, this God-man Jesus to come into my life, he becomes boss. My, my life has changed. It has impact on every aspect of my life. And Jesus' resurrection is the crux of that matter. And then verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That, that word confess, it's, it's a Greek word, basically means to say the same thing or to be in agreement with someone. So the person who confesses that Jesus is Lord, agrees with the Father's declaration that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Now I want you to understand, you see that? With the mouth, the confession is made. You ever hear people say, well, my, my faith is a, is a private thing. Nowhere in the scriptures is Christianity called private. It's personal, but it's never private. And so if you ever say that, you're wrong. And if you ever hear somebody say that, gently remind them that this can't be a private thing. You realize what Jesus did publicly for us? It's the calling of God in our life. Point number five, the, the scope of God's righteousness. Look at verse 11. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him 
will not be put to shame. And it's a quotation here from Isaiah that not only demonstrates that salvation by grace through faith alone has always been God's salvation plan, but that no one, including Gentiles, was ever to be excluded. Verse 12, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Jesus is Lord of all. Everybody has opportunity to hear the good news and allow the Lord to do a good work in their life. That's why when I'm sharing with Tony, it's not like, ah, but the things Tony's done. He's just a little more honest. God saves. And nobody is too far from it. Aren't you glad? Verse 13. I love that Romans 10, by the way, is packed with all these verses that we've heard bunches of times, but in context, it just falls right into place. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's quoting from Joel 2, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I love this. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So in the midst of this prophecy, and Joel has some hard things to say, but you'll always see in the midst of the prophets, these minor prophets, these major prophets, there's grace. There's mercy. You may watch the news right now and see what's going on in our country and it seems like it's so dark. I want you to understand God is still doing a work. And a little, little light can have a huge impact the darker it gets. Allow the Lord to... to and call on the name. This is a familiar Old Testament expression. It doesn't refer to some desperate cry to just any deity, but to the one true God as he has revealed himself. Point number six, the presentation of God's righteousness. Look at verses 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? This, this is, I've heard these, sermon, these verses preached so much at missions conferences. And how are they to believe in him on, of whom they have never heard? And, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? Do you see how God includes us in the process? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, this verse always threw me because I know my feet, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. <sighs> Paul's main point is that there's a series of these rhetorical questions here, and it's a clear presentation of the gospel message that these steps are taken, that God includes us in the process. Beautiful are the feet, Isaiah 52.7 in the midst of a prophecy here. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And I love how the, the word is so perfectly formed because Isaiah 52 comes before Isaiah 53. And he even quotes that as we're coming to that in a little bit as we see point number seven, the rejection of God's righteousness. The verse 16. But they have not obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Look at verse 1 of Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then he goes into the, the best description of the crucifixion and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in all of the Old Testament. Who has believed our report? It can be rejected. Verse 7, and then another verse that we've heard dozens of times. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, 
did Israel not understand? See, in the past I chose you sovereignly, said the Lord to Israel. Presently I've made myself known to you, but you rejected me, so I'm going to provoke you by bringing the Gentiles into the family in order that you might see what you've missed when you neglected the opportunity to be saved. Look at that in verse 19. I will make you jealous. This is from the words of Moses. I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. So we have Israel watching, and they're seeing what God's doing in Gentiles. And I'm not going to ask... I'm not going to ask you to answer this, but I will, if I were to say, how many Jews are in the room? I don't think we'd get a lot of hands. Because God has done this work in us as Brits and Swedes and Africans and Mexicans, and we could go down through the line that the Jews would look at and go, what is God doing? God has been gracious to us. We're not, we're not from that old covenant people, and yet God reached down and saved us. You, re, you do realize the most of our roots are idolatrous. Even those of us, I've got a lot of Brit in me. Remember I did the, remember I did the DNA thing? I wanted to have two things in me. I wanted to be black. I did still do and I wanted to be Jewish nothing I am a honky all right I am white and I could be all proud of and there's great things I mean the sun never set on the British Empire at a point but you do know the roots of their lives were barbarians until Christ came and changed their life the gospel changed them and he goes on, he says this, with a foolish nation, I will make you angry. The end of verse 19, a foolish nation, that's you and me. That's who he's talking. You might be going, I think God's on us on this about this. God's all over us on this thing. But I'll receive it because in his grace, he reaches down and he goes, you're part of a foolish nation, I'll take you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I'll, if that's the way I'm looked at, I'm good because I got you. Verse 20. Then Isaiah is so bold to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself who did not ask for me. Israel's looking and going, I don't get this. In their minds, there goes the neighborhood. And in God's mind, I'm doing a work, and I'm going to keep calling them to, because they cannot rest, in, and we can't either, in our pride that we could fulfill the law and our prejudice that we're, we're, we should be the only ones that are getting this. God's saying, I'm giving it to everybody. Verse 21, but of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And if we left it there, it would be Sad news for Israel, but I want you to know when we get to next week, and as we work through Romans 11, we're going to see Israel does have a future. God's not done because he kept, God made promises and he keeps his promises. He can be trusted. The promises they made to Israel and he fulfilled means that he can, says what he says and means what he means. I was thinking about the, the whole idea of how you and I can miss it. You may even have grown up in church, and if you've never, by grace through faith, have bowed the knee yourself and received Jesus Christ, do not rest in your church lineage. Rest in Christ and Him alone. I heard a story about a group of Spaniards, sold, uh, sailors that were in a boat that just things went bad out in the ocean and they got into a lifeboat and they're making their way and, and as they're making their way and they're seeing shore, they're seeing shore, but every time they're paddling and doing everything they can to get to the shore, they've got this current that is pushing against them and they can't get there. 
And they look, and on the, the coastline, there's some natives that are looking at them, and they're, they're just, and as they're pushing more and more, and they haven't been able to drink because they've been out in the ocean, they're losing strength, they're losing power. Power is ebbing away from them, and they're roasting there in the sun, and, and they're, they're dying. They are dying. And the natives are looking at them and just go, just, just go get water, just get water. And they're looking at them and they're thinking, no, if we do that, that that'll rush our death. So they just keep heading toward death. And the natives are looking, no, no. Just. And so somebody, one of them, finally gets enough guts to go, I'll try. And he starts to drink and he realizes it's, it's, it's fresh water. They weren't in the ocean. They were at the mouth of the Amazon River, and fresh water was all around them. Amazon's a pretty big river. I mean, they, it's not like this thing that sells us everything is called Mississippi. All right, It's called Amazon for a reason. It's big. It's, it's stuff. It, it's out there. And so they're, they're in the, at the mouth of the biggest freshwater source and it's just going right by them. It's like us. If we don't take advantage of the fact that all around us is this truth that I can, that I can lay hold of, that I can drink from. Doc Josh and the time there, communion, talked about that. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you, by faith, received Jesus as your Lord, as your personal Savior? If I were to ask you the question, has there ever been a time where you called out to the name of the Lord to be saved, that you believe this? And you go, yeah, my mom, my mom told me I did that when I was three. No, no it's, it's nice that your mom told you that. All right. But do you? Was there a time that you know? Or you just believe it. You believe it. I put my faith in trust. I don't know the date, but I did that. Rest in that. That's solid ground. But please don't head continually in your Christian life or what you think is a Christian life based on what you, eh, not sure. Know that you can know. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your goodness and grace. And thank you that you have done a work in the past. We've got the blessing of all of those truths from your word early on. And Paul, all he's doing is taking your word from the Old Testament and teaching us the gospel. Because this has always been your way by grace through faith. Thank you, Lord continue doing a work in each of our lives. In Jesus' name.